So we've got a film and a discussion today. After the film, we have Kunle Alilabi, who's one of the African Odyssey Steering Committee, um, as chair for a discussion. And Kunle works as director of Voice for Change. And what he'll do is he'll welcome a panel um, of speakers to respond to the film. And speakers will include Samanwar Sesha, who's a personal, personal development coach, among many other things. Tony Warner, who uh, runs an organization called Black History Walks, and is also the chair of the African Odyssey's steering committee. Um, and Cecil Gutsmore, who is an educator and an activist, um, as all three of our panelists are. <coughs> And after responding to the film, our panel will uh, invite you to put your questions to them. Well, a few, a few thoughts. Um, for me, the importance of Fanon was definitely uh, looking at the period between 1952 and the turning point of his death in the early 60s. Um, the emergence of anti-colonial movements, uh, not just in Algeria, but uh, in Nigeria, in Ghana, uh, in the Caribbean, uh, in South America, and of course India. Um, and I think it's the uh, process of decolonization that Fanon, as, a, as a, both a, a military tactician, as a political theorist, but also as somebody who delved into the realm of subjectivity and the issue of uh, the mental psyche, which I think is really, really important um, because they are areas uh, that seldom get looked at. But I think more importantly, um, uh, we live at a time when uh, the question of both the subjective and the objective conditions has become a point of discussion. And um, I think that in terms of how we go forward in looking at things like how the individual as a black person is perceived in today's society and the relationships between black and white and those that actually influence uh, how we live, where we live, and how we're going to take things forward, I think it's really important uh, uh, to actually see this film even though it's uh, some years since it was made. Uh, in addition, I think it's uh, to note that um, this is uh, a reconditioned uh, uh, presentation of the film. Uh, it's just been reissued uh, and digitally enhanced um, and is available to buy again uh, in the BFI shop. Uh, and in particular, this edition is dedicated to uh, Stuart Hall uh, and uh, Fanon himself. And also that's the significance of its uh, reissue. Um, so, uh, in terms of introduction, I'm not going to be too formal, because I know most of these characters. Uh, uh, on my far left is Cecil. I first met Cecil uh, many years ago. Actually remember? Yes, uh, <laughs> doing research <laughs> on the equal opportunities policies of the Ford Motor Company in Britain, and the implications of that for investment in the Dagenham car plant. Uh, Tony, to my immediate left, has uh, been a collaborator with African Odyssey, somebody I've known since the days of uh, our time in the London Borough of Camden, oh, yeah. when uh, uh, he was then uh, uh, a keen student of history and presented a number of seminars for us at the British Museum. Uh, Sam and Wasser, I think um, David in your introduction was being uh, rather modest. I mean, Sam and Wa used to be head of Decibel at the Arts Council. Previous to that, she was also one of the uh, leading uh, commissioners and producers of arts uh, in Camden, and uh, was uh, Kensington and Chelsea as the head of arts and culture for a period of time, including being in charge of uh, a Notting Hill Carnival. Um, so uh, we have uh, an esteemed panel, and there are some questions that I'd like to fire off at them first of all, but um, I'd, I will bring uh, people in the audience in. Um, and please try and keep your remarks when I do uh, concise and precise. I know this is not an easy subject 
to tackle, but um, uh, try and be as uh, concise as you possibly can be, and that will help the discussion. So first off, in terms of looking at this film, obviously the issue of blackness and negritude is something that is touched upon in the early part of the film. Mm -hmm. Amir Cesar, who is uh, uh, a kind of mentor in many respects to Fanon, um, when we look at the book, White, uh, White Skin, um, it's kind of, <laughs> it's, for me, it gets at the very essence of one of the key issues, which is looking at how black people are seen in contemporary white society. The relationship in terms of uh, the colonies is obviously at the sh kind of center of that. But the, the issue of Afrocentrism today, looking at society, I mean, uh, everybody at the moment is, is discussing diversity, you know, even Hollywood. Uh, every institution is looking at um, race, it seems, in a different way. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the idea put forward about, for example, it talks about the gays mm -hmm. and the problem of the return of the gays. Um, is it the case that today we can actually look at society and say, well, actually, Afrocentrism is cool? Uh, I mean, I'm sure there were some people here last night who were at the Black Panther screening. Anybody? Who else? Anybody? Anybody? No? No. Not really? Not a single soul. <laughs> Couldn't get tickets. <laughs> Not for trying. I mean, you know, even Marvel Comics now has a kind of Afrocentric view of the world and is taking that on board. So, mm. you know, are we saying black is now cool or is this an illusion? A difficult question and, and, and actually not, not the one for Fruition film. I, I think it's a very fine film um, and, for example, it starts with a reading of, of Black Skin, White Mask, which is not mine, but I, I see very much what it's doing and approve of what it's doing and it does it rather creatively. But, but that book for me um, sits in the moment out of which it comes and in that moment what is happening, as you say, is, is, um, is, 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 is negritude is, is the work of some significant Africans like, like Sheikh Ante Dio. And one of the things that, um, that, that, that Fano is concerned with is now that we know the quality of our African heritage, what do we do with it? And, and, and he, he deals with this in a, an incredibly complex and, and rich and non-surrendering way. And because He's influenced by France and interested in science. He doesn't want to fall for the race argument, even though nobody's more conscious of, of, of race than him. So we end up with a very complex text. And all of the stuff that the film says is in it, is in it. But I feel that this other stuff to be much more central. Um, it made me think of my dad, because my dad is from St. Lucia, which is, you can actually stand in St. Lucia and see Martinique. When he was growing up, he was not a he, he could speak Creole, so they could actually speak. There's a language they can speak, which um, is a combination of original African languages and some European languages, and it's spoken in Martinique and also Saint Lucia. So he could speak Creole, but he wasn't allowed to speak it in the house. So when I saw that part, I thought, oh, this is what this is what they were talking about because you weren't allowed to actually be yourself in your own country, but you were encouraged to be French or British or Spanish. So you actually grew up in the Caribbean with a European mindset. When it came to films now, and I mentioned films a couple of times there, um, people in the Caribbean grew up watching Tarzan movies. So if you were <laughs> living in the Caribbean, Jamaica, and St. Lucia, you'd be, you'd be watching Tarzan movies and you'd take on board the images of Africa. So there was no Afrocentrism, Afrocentrism at that time. And even now, the, you don't tend to get a lot of films in the Caribbean produced in Africa by African people. You get stuff from America, but you definitely don't get a kind of African-centric view in the Caribbean even now. Um, as far as the path is concerned, it made me think again about history when it comes to images and that we had a black superhero called Blade. Remember Blade? The movie came out in, in mm -hmm. 1998 Wesley and it was mm -hmm. a Wesley Snipes and he made $100 million and made two sequels and it's taken 20 years to have another black superhero which is going to make another $100 million. But what happened in, in the meantime and who's going to benefit from all that African-centric history in the Marvel movie? That's, that's not, I don't know. Who's going to get the money from that? That's what makes me think. Mm -hmm. but, in terms of language, though, Fanon is looking at um, the colonized in the metropole yeah. and the way that, uh, for example, um, 
French, uh, blacks in the metropole tried to take on the uh, French nationalistic characteristics mm -hmm. in terms of their pronunciation of language yeah. and in, to an extent that he, he jokes about it and says that he can tell when yeah. it's been put on and yeah. being affected. But um, this notion of, I suppose, um, uh, Afrocentricity, what I suppose I'm saying is that the white mask has it been removed? Is it still way? is it still relevant? Yeah. I mean, mm. it. Yeah, I think I'm I'm with I'm I'm with Tony in that sense of I'm old enough to have seen the cycles of um, Afrocentrism being popular in the 70s and then fading and then coming back and then fading and then coming back and then fading and and what does that empowerment mean for us both as individuals and as communities in terms of our own um, powers? You know, the institutions have not followed. For me, Fanon is absolutely still relevant, but possibly in a different context, because when he was writing, he was writing very much in the context of nationalism. And now we think more in terms of um, diaspora. And I think that one of the contradictions of Fanon, which is, which is difficult, is that because he approaches it very much in the sense of nationalism, but then he, in his desire and need for these freedoms, he derobes himself of his nationalism and takes on another one. Um, and, you know, and I think that is what is interesting about Fanon, is, is as much the contradictions as those, the more you know, things that are spoken of in terms of the white mask. I think the issue of the white mask, that, yeah, it, it, is it still there? Definitely. Could, could I just say that? that I, I feel that, right, there is, Fanon is, is so big and bright that he's, he's way above the kind of circumstances in which he finds himself. So at, at, at the moment when we encounter him, he's already been a war hero. He's, he's already um, uh, discovered that he's better than the French peasantry because they don't want to fight, and, and, and he has. Um, so, so, so that he's, he's really has a massively well-developed consciousness and one of the dif difficulties that I have with the film is, is, is that it kind of presents him as this, this, this diffident figure. And, and he really absolutely wasn't. He knew exactly <laughs> where things were. He, he, he knew that, that having fought against, um, fought for France, he mm -hmm. discovers that France isn't worth fighting for, and he ends up discovering that France has to be fought against because as bad as the Nazis, it's, it's doing terrible things in, in Algeria and, and in, in, in East Asia, just as the British is doing terrible things, um, having condemned the Nazis in, in East Africa, in Kenya, and, 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 and elsewhere. So, so Thano is, is not this diffident, almost confused a man who doesn't know where things are. He knows the world, and he has a full analysis of it, and that's present in his work. He even has an analysis of it which goes to what people are calling post-colonialism wrongly. He has a view of the world about neocolonialism and, and, and is the leading theorist, or certainly one of the leading theorists on, on that state of affairs, which is how things are now in all of the places where black people who are not in the metropoles live in the Caribbean and Africa and so on. Just following on from that and looking at this issue of uh, neocolonialism, um, one of the things that I felt was, was really important also about his thinking was in relation to how he, he seems to anticipate what's coming next um, in relation to uh, he would have seen um, Nkrumah coming to power in Ghana in 1957. Uh -huh. He would have seen uh, the, the, the wind of change speech uh -huh. that of course affected um, British colonization and the policy of government to begin the process of withdrawal. Uh -huh. But what he's uh, very kind of clear on is that um, what he's, no, he's not looking for is um, decolonization but a rupture uh -huh. of the colonial experience. Yeah. And I mean, although I haven't really focused on it, um, it's very clearly in the early part of the film, the issue of violence mm -hmm. is pushed um, to the forefront. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'd be interested to get the panelists' views on you know, how they see uh, Fanon's relationship to this issue of violence. Because in a lot of the writings that I was reading in, in building up to this, 
it's, uh, it's there pushed at the forefront. Mm. Uh, and in fact, Baba, who opens the film, mm. straight away is almost like, um, begins a critique of Fanon from that standpoint. Mm -hmm. I don't want to take it first, so yeah. let my colleagues talk. I'm happy to have a go, but I think, <laughs> and it really is just to have a go, but because to me the, the issue of violence for Fanon, from Fanon is definitely twofold. There is the violence of what is necessary because power is never given. Yes, so it has to be taken, and how you choose to take it, there is going to be a, a degree of violence. But the need for taking it and what happens to a society that is... Um, the, the society that he is describing at the time of writing this one, his, which is his, you know, his earliest book, it, for me, and this is my reading of it, it is actually more of a psychological violence in terms of what it has done and the far, and for me, the far, most far-reaching nature of this particular work, not necessarily the film, but the, but the book, is the psychological impact of that and what it has done. And what I think is very interesting at the beginning of the film, when, um, when Hall talks about the need of both parties, so the need that, that the colonizer has for the colonized to look at them in a particular way and to be seen in a particular way. And for me, the look is where the violence lives and it is a harder, more nuanced area to, to deal with and that is for me why Fanon is still so strong. Um, the other violence we know of, yes, it's cruder, it's more obvious, it's there, it's, it's, a, it's about, it's a struggle for power, it's, it's, it's physical. But that psychological violence that is alive and well today, in fact, growing, is, is the one that interests me more. Mm. So he, he was a soldier, he fought in World War II, so he knew all about violence, and he, he recognized, well, he, he fought as far as he was concerned, for, but a per, for people to be free, they have to involve in physical struggle, otherwise they won't, they won't grow. He actually said that going through the process of that fighting will help you liberate your mind. So that was, that was the angle he was coming from. And of course, you're thinking about <coughs> Vietnam, you can think about Algeria, and think about um, the fact that black French troops from Senegal were sent to Vietnam to fight against the Vietnamese. Mm -hmm. So he knew all this kind of stuff. And also, when he was writing, he wasn't just writing for that kind of um, massive war on, on, on all different fronts. He was also talking about people like the Black Panther. Well, not, People like the Black Panthers read him and took from him what they will, and that they actually used kind of the arms struggle to liberate themselves, as well as the ANC. So again, his words and his thinking from that period of time are still having an effect on us even to this very day. Right. I mean, right. The, to end with the Panthers, and, and the Panthers were entirely symbolic violence. You know, carrying the gun. They never used any guns on on, on anybody. Guns were used on the Panthers. All of their leadership were um, exterminated. Um, when people talk about Fanon and, and talk violence, what they're primarily doing is, is dismissing him. They're saying, this is a kind of George Sorel figure without the point. Um, in fact, as has already been said, Fanon was a soldier. I think he'd actually won a, a, a serious um, honor from, 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 from the French state. So that's one thing. But when he turned against the French state, he was focusing on um, uh, settler colonialism. And settler colonialism is quintessentially violent. They don't want to move, and you have to move them. So it follows that violence is of the essence of the struggle against um, settler colonialism. And it doesn't matter whether it's South Africa or Kenya or, or Algeria or Israel. And if you don't succeed in the military struggle against them, they sit there forever as is happening in Palestine. So um, let's, let's be clear. And, 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 and Fanon is a revolutionary. And, and there are many kinds of revolution. So there's an anti-colonial revolution, which is what happens in Algeria. And it doesn't touch. They talk about the, 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 um, the, the you know, culture coming back to haunt the revolution. It, that's not quite what happens. What happens is that. Um, the, 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 the Algerian revolution hasn't touched Algerian culture other than in the ways we see in the film where um, dress can be used as part of the, 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 the armed struggle, as a weapon of concealment, and, 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 and so on. But the women are left I, um, where they are, and the men continue to have all the ideas they used to have before. So after they, they, the, the French have gone, um, it's the Algeria that was. 
And since then, there's been a civil war, which has been about, and with the West supporting one side, millions of people dying, so that the good Muslims who the West support can run the place, which is what's happening in Egypt and, 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 and so on. So Fanon, even though he was long dead, would have, and in significant way, did understand that, which is why, again, he's a theorist, theorist of neocolonialism. But an incomplete revolution, you know, and we see we, there's some complete revolutions in the world. Cuba is one. The, the, the Chinese, leave aside what they're doing with, with revolution now. Those are revolutions that actually liberate people from prior systems of, 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 of oppression and give people a space to make themselves decent human beings. And that didn't happen in Algeria in quite the way, or if it did happen, the Algerian didn't take the um, opportunity. And the same thing's happening in South Africa, where the, the anti apartheid revolution gave Africans a space which they proceeded to subvert, and we end up with Marikana where the, the, the ANC is shooting down its own, own people and, and, and so on, the complex. But the thing about violence, don't let them trip you on it. Okay, okay. Um, just leading on from that, and I think Cecil's briefly touched on it, the question of the role of women in the struggle uh, is touched upon in the film, and in particular seen through the issue of the veil. Mm. Um, and we see that scene uh, whereby the Algerian woman uh, wears the veil um, and is seen by the French soldier, the occupiers, mm. as a non-threatening image. But in fact, she's got a pistol hidden under the veil and hands the gun, and that gun is then used to assassinate a police officer. Now, um, when Fanon is writing about the unveiling of, uh, in Algeria, it's kind of, um, again, it's one of those moments where you think it's quite far-sighted in terms of looking at society today and the whole debate around the covering of women, uh, the hijab and the veil. Um, Stuart Hall in the film is, tends to be slightly dismissive at the end of the day and says it's, it's kind of, Fanon's a bit uh, romantic in his views about um, uh, the traditions, um, Islamic traditions in particular, and oh, it's overestimating the significance of the veil, essentially. My kind of, um, uh, kind of take on it is also the, the way that the veil and the hijab has become uh, a big symbol in terms of the issue around um, uh, Islamic radicalism, mm -hmm. uh, and to the extent that uh, I think it's Alison Pearson in the Daily Mail made a point about saying that um, she couldn't really give um, two hoots about what women wear. If women want to wear it, that's their business. But what she really is preoccupied by is what the actual um, veil and the scarf um, symbolize. And it seems to me that um, the question of that symbol is something that has more resonance now than probably at the time when Fanon was writing, and indeed even when this film was made. Um, my, my own view is, is that the, the film o overdoes that and that Stuart is just wrong in calling it romantic. Um, and Stuart didn't get everything right, and that, that's one, one, one of the things he got wrong. So how the veil and female existence was used in that revolution in the Algerian Revolution wasn't at all romantic. It was actually revolutionary. And, and, and people are wrong, wrong to, to, to say that. But the, the focus on it, which, which is a smaller factor than, than should have been in, 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 in the film, is, you know, it, I, 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 it's, it's in the film because the director is Stuart's um, student and that's the kind of thing they're interested in and it's not illegitimate but so, some of it gets in the way of what was really happening in the Algerian uh, revolution and how we need to understand um, issues of, 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 of gender in, in revolutionary situations and how we understand um, issues of, of gender and sexuality and, and body covering in moments like this where um, the West is on a, 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 an, an anti-Islamic ramp.
ideological um, okay. and Islamic ground. Let's hold that thought there. Um, I'm going to bring Sam and where are you? I don't have much to say on this, because I, not because there's not lots to say there is. It's, it, I, it's basically because we do not have time to cover fashion, the woman's body, the revolutionary nature of fashion and the woman's body and the male hypocrisy of talking about it at all. So, I really think that it is, it, it is, too, it is too big here. There's so much else in, in fandom that we can deal with. The, 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 the female body and what clothes it, it, you know, that's another conversation. So. Okay, um, all right. At that point, I'm now going to open it up to questions and comments from the audience. As I say, please try and keep your uh, comments concise so we can get in as many contributions as possible. Hi. I'd just like to raise one issue. Um, it's commented in the film that when Fanon went to France, effectively, and observed the role of the French in their own liberation, that it gave him a very clear idea that there wasn't a force in France to resist Nazi, the Nazi aggression. You also have the situation where those same people could go into colonies i.e. Algeria, Mor uh, Morocco, the Caribbean, and actually become more violent than the violence needed to protect themselves in their own metropolitan societies. And that's a very interesting point for anybody who came out of those situations into the metrop metropolitan areas, observed, in a sense, the populace at work, and went back with a reformed idea of their own liberation. And I think that that is one of the issues in the film. That, that certainly struck me. And can I just jump in? Because that happened with guys from the Caribbean who came here to help Britain in World War II as well. So yes. a lot of guys who, who left from Jamaica, Central Trinidad, came here to help Britain fight the war. And they found there was people here who said, what the hell you come from Barbados to join the war for? You should stay where you were. Yeah, they were literally, fight it. They were literally told that, right? Why would you? Yes. And then, of course, after war was over, they found it hard to get a job and were racially abused in the street. So some of them actually did go back to the camp and got involved in um, what you could say liberation work. So that same experience happened here. And the other thing about that, the Martinique situation is that the French would send highly qualified, not highly qualified, lowly skilled people, white people, to Martinique to run Martinique. And then highly skilled black Martinicans were leaving Martinique to go and work in um, France, but could only get jobs as bus drivers or street sweepers. And they were up there, the group is, they called that group the Boomidon group. We actually should have filmed it at the BFL about it. But basically, you had the same situation happening in um, England as happened in France when you had migrants coming from the colonies to help that country recover from World War II and being treated like second class citizens. So it's, it's very interesting when you think about it. Also, just to pick up on that point, because it's a very interesting thing that I believe is happening right now in Europe. And, and I think it is the difference between Britain and the rest of Europe that it is separating itself from at the moment politically, but obviously not geographically. But it is, but, but it is that sense that as those forces, especially at the time then of Nazism, and we may say so again, but of, of a different type, um, and in a different way, are asserting themselves, it is all about what comes back, what fights back. What is interesting in what you look at what is happening, if you look at what is happening in Italy now, in Austria, in other parts of Europe, it's looking at what is and where is the fight back coming from? Where is the resistance? How strong is that resistance? Whereas the one reason the only part of Europe I could ever live in is this one is because the resistance is always there. So, um, and I really think that that is one of the underexplored elements of the European dynamic or Western Asia, as my brother calls it, dynamic that is that has fruit for us to, to learn more about. Yeah. My own view is that um, the, 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 the pushing of European societies to the, to, to the right um, is a function clearly of the failure of capitalism, but there's some specific things, like they go and disrupt real societies, mash them up physically, and drive people out. And those people have to come here, and then <laughs> there's a, there is a, a, a struggle around how many of them and where they go and all of that. And it's perfectly convenient to the system because it pushes the whole politics to the right, which is perfectly desirable for those who run things. And meantime, it's very bad for the people at the bottom who they then persuade 
that it makes sense to leave the European on, on a basis of, of, of a kind of racist nationalism, that it makes sense to leave the, 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 the common market, which they join Britain now in a moment of economic desperation. I was old enough and I studied it and I know why they joined. And it's actually shaming, disgraceful, that having joined and got the benefits, all of those Japanese investors, investors are here because they could sell into Europe. Britain's, Britain's capital does not invest in the British domestic economy. It's too busy investing abroad, right? The, the, the city's money goes abroad. It doesn't go into British industry. So all of that industry, even Indian and Chinese um, thing is here. And they're here because they can sell into Europe. And we allow something that came out of the Tory party, a dispute within the Tory party, to, to, to call a ref referendum. And we allow ourselves to be persuaded that it's something to do with democracy. It's something to do with democracy. The war actually does throw up many contradictions. Uh, and Fanon is in a hospital treating um, French soldiers who are psychologically scarred by what they're having to deal with. Yeah. Um, and he feels that this is, uh, first of all, something that he does as a job. But then, actually, I think later on, he questions his own loyalties mm -hmm. and says, I've made a mistake, you know? And the, he sides with the Algerians in this context. And I think that that um, contradiction gets thrown up, not just in the sense of Fanon, but also in India, where the Indian Nationalist Army fought on the side of the Japanese against the Allies. We also have uh, questions of uh, revolts. So for example, even working class communities in this country, there were mutinies during the Second World War that never get discussed. Um, you know, the, the question of you know, war as, as somebody once said, it's like the locomotive of history. Mm -hmm. And you throws up things that um, uh, aren't ordinarily um, dealt with in the, the kind of usual discourse of society. And I suppose the most extreme example, of course, being the Spanish Civil War, in which the same North Africans that Fanon is talking about were, were used by Franco mm -hmm. as the flash troops to attack the Republic. Uh, again, something that never gets talked about. Um, and those Moroccans who fought with Franco were all given pensions after the Spanish Civil War. Ironically, the French and Senegalese soldiers that fought on the side of France did not get their pensions until I think it was about 2002, yeah, yeah. that it was agreed by the French yeah, parliament. Yeah. And, and yet yes, the fascists, yes, uh, you know, I have Moroccan friends whose grandfathers are still drawing Partly triggered by a film called um, Days of Glory or the Indig Indigenes in the original yeah. French. Mm -hmm. It's basically about um, a story about the black French troops who fought for France during World War II were very good at what they did and helped the, helped, helped the French to actually win the war. Um, and then afterwards over, because their leaders left for independence, then de Gaulle said, you're not going to get, get no pension. And they didn't get any pension at all up until that film came out. And there was a big embarrassment they changed rules a little bit. But by that time, most of the guys had died. And another thing about the war is that you think about Kenya, there were Kenyan troops who left Kenya to fight for Britain. They fought against the Japanese in Bremen and Malaysia. Mm -hmm. But when they got back to Kenya themselves, their land was given to white yeah. soldiers yes. who'd emigrated yes. from England in Surrey to live in Kenya and got the best land. And they got kicked off. Yeah. And there was a could, okay. could, I, could I just Can you make keep your hands up, please, those that have got questions or comments? Okay. Hello. Um, I was just thinking about um, uh, what Franz Fennel um, actually went through in terms of like when he went to, um, uh, to live in um, France um, and um, he met the gazes of um, the mother and child, which actually fractured his psyche. Um, it seemed to me that that's actually quite a good thing, if you can actually go through that process of shattering you know, the white mask, um, and if you can uh, construct a true perception of where you really are. Um, because in his particular life, it seemed to have led to a life of action where um, he actually put his principles and beliefs um, uh, into action uh, to make a difference. Um, he was willing to fight for what was necessary. Um, I've been uh, doing a black history course with Robin Walker, and we actually covered um, black skins, white masks. And, and we actually looked at the, um, the actual text um, from a more academic point of view. 
So I didn't really have an understanding of his, um, his life story and his background. So this has really informed me quite a lot. And, and one of the things that Robin talked about is how in society today, um, many people experience racism, but on a somewhat incidental level. So it shatters or it disrupts their perception of how they see themselves in society. But very often, it's not enough to actually get them to transition to actually doing something uh, on a more practical basis to improve their um, circumstances. So they kind of like go back to a default dis um, scenario. Um, and um, he feels that um, only a few people actually get to the point where they realize that they have to actually do something constructive. And I actually feel that I actually see that um, in my surroundings as well. Um, so I suppose my question is, um, how can we get to a point where we can shatter more of these masks more permanently? And, and, and what can we do to actually get people to become more engaged in their own mental liberation? Okay, I'm going to take Sam yeah. and Mark. No, 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 no. Oh, okay, so, so I'm quite excited about this one because <laughs> I was here last night. <laughs> um, and, uh, but, but also because the, the Fallon himself in, um, oh, The Wretched, what was it? It was The Wretched of the Earth. Thank you. In The Wretched of the Earth, talks about every generation as needing a cause. And I've been thinking a lot about that. And I think that as a generation, we have chosen, because we are the generation of the power of advertising, we have chosen representation as our cause. And I think that, it, that the way that is playing itself out, whether it be in film or in novels or in music or whatever, but, but we have chosen. And as we're becoming a more visual culture and a less um, a culture that is less about what is written, but more what is about what, about, what is about what is seen. That that is becoming even more powerful. Yes. So the the idea of how you can actually shatter the glass. We were talking earlier about our, our own moments of naivety falling away, and and what happened in those instances. It can happen in two hours of a film. It can happen. It can be that dramatic. And the thing about art is it can take you there in a relatively short period. So somebody who may not have studied, who may not have had the book, who may not have been led in a particular direction, can go and see a film and go on a journey. And in fact, the director spoke quite, I was going to say eloquently, but that's not the right word. <laughs> but he, he actually talked about how in a film you can time travel. So even though you're only spending an hour and 20 minutes in that space, you can actually travel 100 years, depending on the way the film is edited. And depending on an understanding the dynamics of drama and what that can do to a person's emotional self, you can actually crack in that space. And that's the power that it has. So I believe that part of, not exclusively, but part of what you're talking about can be captured by creative journeys and things like films, and also novels and music, but very particularly films because of the time that we're in and the visual culture and the shit. That's probably enough of that. But I, I know it's in the film, and, and, and Fanon is supposed to be this tortured soul that, that has his you know, identity ripped apart when he arrives in front. But it's not, it, and some of it is in his work, but it's not true. Fanon discovers, uh, the, the racism of France in his childhood. Fanon discovers the racism of France and the, the rightward possibilities of French colonialism in Martinique during that war, when they have black people doing Nazi salutes, that actually in the film. And he revolts against that, and he's a man of action right from the start. He doesn't become a man of action in, 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 in France. right? And, and it's very important that you know individual ones of us can have self-revelatory experiences, um, but we mustn't put them on, on, on to Fanon. And, and I think there's a little bit of a problem with the way in which the, <laughs> although it's a good film, so I'm not, not, not you know, knocking it, um, but it's very important that we understand who and what Fanon was and where he started from and what he took with him to North Africa and to Europe. And, and this is a man who made decisions that were very clearly made at each stage of his life. I write this book as my, my um, doctorate thesis. I do this, I do that. I'm, I, I don't want to do psych psychiatry in France. I want to go to Algeria. In Algeria, he discovers that there's a colonial malady. 
um, and, 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 and so on and so forth. This is, this is not a tortured soul. I'm not saying it wasn't conflicted, you know, but we need to just read Fanon. Uh, so just quickly is that um, when he went, when the black troops were sent back to Martinique, they went in cargo ships, not in kind of regular troop ships. So even that experience would have given people a little insight to how racist the French were. But as far as um, making people kind of change, have a shat experience or whatever, um, showing this film is, is one of these ways of addressing those issues in that this actually sold out two weeks ago. So we could, have, we could have had another 100 people in this room or another screen of this incident. So having to sh sh being able to show this film actually helps me kind of understand what France Panel is about. And also, if you think about you know how to get people to get against France Panel, France Panel is not on the curriculum for psychology in this country. I mean, I've had Oxford students of psychiatry and psychology come on my walks, come, on, come to the events of this, and they've never heard of France Panel, and they're doing a degree, three years, four years at Oxford and Cambridge. Also in the Caribbean, there's have cousins who are 21, they're doing psychiatry or psychology at University of West Indies. Never heard of France when I had to tell them, and this is like two, last year actually, last year. So, challenging the curriculum is another way of doing it. And also having events like this where people can find out about France when and discuss discoveries with them. Does anybody know the name of the play? There's a play that Cal Churchill did about Fanon. It's very, very rarely put on. It's about his time um, in, in Algeria in the war, on the ward. I cannot remember the no. name, but if you ever see it being staged, go and see it. It's a fantastic play. It's a fantastic use of a couple of hours. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think just to be clear, you know, Fanon's analysis is not just about the psyche of the colonized, it's also the colonizer. Yes. And it's, the, it's that Absolutely. duality that makes him so sophisticated because he's un trying to understand the limitations that are placed on both. I just wondered what the panel thought about exploring the challenges on the colonizers as well in relation to something like the cheddar man whose skin was discovered as dark. What, what, what does the panel think that has? Because we're, you, you spoke in the beginning about the experience on the diaspora and how their understanding of or, or Afrocentricity being cool, what impact it should have on them, but what about the impact on others about the realities of their background. Funnily enough, um, before the screening, we actually had a conversation about this. Um, so. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't, you don't want me to start on this one. OK, so Cheddar Man is my new dance. But no, OK, um, let, me, let, me, let me be serious. Um, basically, we know we are at a very particular time, yeah? And, and one of the things that we were saying before we, before we came in to watch the film was that, um, <sighs> Yeah, we are living at a very particular time, and there's, we know that one of the things that is not being disputed in science is that we all started in Africa, okay, and that we moved from Africa. So to many of us, the idea that a 10,000-year-old man in Britain is, um, has brown skin is not remotely surprising. Yeah? However, we do sometimes, even though we're sharing a planet, sharing a country, sharing an island, actually live on different planets, where to other people that is the most extraordinary scientific <laughs> stroke fake news ever. <laughs> and, and, and that is the challenge, that for some of us it's like, and? And for others it's like, <laughs> that's insane! Um, and, and, and that is, so in one way it reveals to us the enormous fractures within our own society. Yeah, just, just the differences in the reactions um, and, and the emotion that it is provoking. But that emotion is being provoked during a very particular time. I, I, I could go on, so I'm going to pause. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> to put it bluntly, you know, the origins of uh, humanity and the Rift Valley in Kenya is, yeah. you know, a scientific fact. And um, the fact of the matter is Kenya is the most diverse genetically the most diverse part of the planet. Um, in fact, Europe is less diverse than that part of Africa. Oh. And the, the, the questions <laughs> really um, that's posed is that both Chinese scientists and European scientists have denied this reality. And so uh, when we see Cheddar Man, uh, it comes, as Simon was indicated, as a surprise to some people, or a lot of people, but not so much a surprise. I mean, even going back to uh, the 1970s, we were talking about the Black Uhuru record, the whole world is Africa. Um, people have known, but obviously people didn't take on board the seriousness and, 
the gravity of what that statement meant, um, people are beginning to understand. I mean, that's my view. Cecil? In that conversation to which they're referring, I made this point, which is that all of what they've said is true with, with regard to Cheddar Man and the, 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 the blackness of the initial populations in this place. Nothing else is possible, clearly. But there has been a transformation in, in, in humanity. It's to do with um, a whole series of processes that are well known to, 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 e to Egypt, um, to e evolutionists, which I won't go into. And it's produced a racial diversity in the world which matters. So that I, as an African, wants to assert my Africanness on the basis of biology, facial features, hair type, skin color, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm very different from that gentleman in, 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 in the middle, and it matters. And going along with that is a whole cultural heritage which I value and which is very different from, 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 from his. So when I'm in Southern Africa and I'm on a program about who is an African, and people phone up and say, Europeans, that I'm African because my grandfather was born here. I say that is rubbish. What it gives you is right to citizen, citizenship in the place that you are. It doesn't make you African. African means something very specific, genetically and historically, and I'm not about to abandon it. Whether UNESCO tells me so or whichever university um, professor tells me so, it is rubbish. Thank you. Okay. But, uh, but I do think the DNA thing is actually very interesting because that what, they, what, what is not often discussed is that the DNA sequencing was done with the absence of any African content. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then it was like, oh, mistake. So they had to redo it. And then when they redid it, that is when they actually recognized that there was more diversity in the DNA of between, say, me and Kunle than there was in the entire European population. Mm -hmm. And that has, again, these things are not discussed. So in terms of what is shared and what is not, if those things were discussed, if those things were more widely shared, then there would be less shock at the brown-skinned, blue-eyed, you know, man from Cheddar. Yeah. So, yeah. so to sum it up, when we're looking at issues of race, we are looking at something which is sociologically given Absolutely. and rather than something that's determined by bi biology. Although, of course, there are certain schools of thought. I specifically UCL, disagree with that. Well, Let me just register You can that. disagree. <laughs> but there are certain schools, such as UCL, uh, who have been the focus of uh, the discussion and debate around eugenics and uh, humanity for uh, decades. And certainly, uh, the reactionary element of scientific racism is something that is worthy of a discussion on its own. And reasserting and I, itself. And I don't really want to get into that now, <laughs> but that's where we are with Cheddar Man. <laughs> so. I wonder what the panel thought about this constant gaze of the, the colonized and this concept of the other and defining oneself by the other. I mean, it's 2018. Surely we've got our own ability to define who we are and as opposed to comparing ourselves against Europeans constantly. Um, surely it should be reversed, some academics suggest. Do you want to come back in on that? Um, <laughs> it's one of the things we were discussing. I mean, I, I, I am actually done with this conversation about us and the othering and all the rest of it. I, it's, it's so over. I think um, and also in a bigger geopolitical sense, not just me individually being done with it, but I think there are bigger questions that need to be asked. Um, I currently do an unconscious bias workshop and it is absolutely fascinating because when I, and I do it predominantly with white organizations, most of them in the cultural world, and um, uh, for white people to actually have a conversation about race where they do not feel they're going to be called racist, they find it liberating and necessary and important. And I believe that is because they do not feel able to talk about themselves because they are so busy looking at the other. Um, and I think it's time for a complete reversal. I, I hope that people in academia are starting to look differently at this paradigm um, because I think that time has come. So I suppose that's a very long-winded way of me saying I agree with you. It's time for a different gaze. Tony, any thoughts on this? Nothing to add, really, no. Okay. Yeah, just very briefly, I've never been impressed by, by any of that stuff that talks about other and this post stuff. And about 20 years ago, I wrote an article, the title of which was All the Posts Are Rotten. 
and, and that included post-colonialism and all of those other foolish posts that, post, that, that post. fill academic journals. Never been impressed by it. I believe it to be rubbish, and that's where I stand on it. Okay, yeah. Um, I did a, a thing for Index on Censorship looking at taboos, uh, and one of the thoughts that came to my mind was that um, the question of whiteness and what white people think about race is something that doesn't get explored as much as the question of black people as the subject. I know that um, there's a very uh, well-known book out uh, that makes the point that they no longer want to talk about race um, to white people. And I think that um, there is a discussion to be had uh, that we need to have. It's quite urgent. Um, but it's a different discussion about race than what we've been having up to now. Um, because I think there is um, very much a danger now that white people feel uncomfortable in these discussions about race uh, through ideas that in some way the finger is being pointed or they're afraid of saying the wrong thing at the wrong time. And so we're not having a kind of free-flowing um, exchange of views. And I think that there is definitely some credence in that. Um, people may disagree. But I think that there is a time now for a, maybe a different discussion about race that needs to be had. Also, sorry, just a thought on that, because we are actually in the BFI and we are talking about film. And um, the film Get Out, which, um, which came out last year, and did you say it's going to be shown at Bathroom? It's then? been shown this afternoon, this afternoon, I think, yeah, about 6.30 at Bathroom. Okay, so, so what was very interesting about that, I mean, there were tons of things that were interesting about it. Sorry, hands up, who saw it? Who's seen Get Out? Oh, hey, loving it. Okay, so, but I think one of the interesting things about that film is that that was a shaped gaze that was different from anything we have ever seen. That was a gaze that was looking in a different direction. I Yes, I, I know the film. I know I, the film. I, just which you're talking. Like, I do fervently disagree with that. I think it's decades before there was a film by Harry Belafonte with John Travolta in it, of which essentially was a reverse of racism. Which was, if anybody out there needs to Google that and see it, I recommend that. I'm, I'm not taking away Get Out. I think it's a modern sort of take on that. But I think there are other versions of that truth. And my overall point is. Um, I, 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 I'm glad that you agree with the essence of what I'm saying because I think that in 2018 we really surely should be looking at our own sense of self and defining our political economic stances on that basis and not on this, this idea that Europeans or any, anybody else tell us who we are, what we can do, when we can do it and how we do it. Now, I think every other nation seems to have no problem doing this. If you look at the Chinese, if you look at uh, the North, you know, the, the South Asians and everybody else. So I don't think I don't think it's problematic saying that. I don't think it's anything new. But what I'd like to see from the fresh thinkers, and I'm a doctorate student myself, about to complete a PhD. So I, so I'd like to see more sort of courageous, forthright thinking in this area because I don't see it at present. I don't see it in forums where I go to look at analysis of this this subject at all. And I agree completely with Kunle. I think there's there's a need to have these discussions. <laughs> But I think there is something to be said about that because there's a reason that you do not see it. So because I've worked most of my life in the cultural industry, so people saying, oh, racism is happening in the prison service, it's happening in education, it's happening in all sorts of places. The most powerful place in which racism operates is in the cultural realm. So the conversations that you want to have, the conversations that many people want to have, and the leaders of power in those areas are extraordinary. And personally, I believe that that's where the the biggest war is being formed. May I just say yeah. that um, I, I was briefly in the 1980s a race trainer, and Never. all of the Never. yes, I was, and all of the diff <laughs> all of the difficulties that, that that he's talking about and you're talking about were really very real then, and I'm hoping that Kunli and whoever else will come up with, with, with a, a way of talking about race that doesn't make white people un uncomfortable. Because, yeah. um, back to Stuart Hall, who did have some sensible things to say, and one of the things he said was that the, the system that we live under is structured in racism, mm. so you don't escape it. it. And, and, and white people have it 
structured into their heads, as indeed do some, 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 some black people. So I'd be very interested in Kunli or anybody else mm -hmm. coming up, this is repetition, with a mode of discourse around race that doesn't make white people uncomfortable. So Impossible. I have to respond to that. I mean, I feel that it's 2018. Why on earth are we concerned about what white people think? I agree with you. Why on <laughs> earth are we still <laughs> concerned <laughs> about what the hell <laughs> white people think? I, for one, don't wake up in the morning thinking, oh my God, I'm, patri I'm petrified what my white neighbor will think of me or what my political views are. I think it's absolutely absurd. I, no disrespect, Cecil, I've read your work. I've got immense respect for your work and you know, and all of those trailblazers and pioneers in the 80s of which you certainly held in high esteem, but I have to take issue with that. I think, you know, we, we have our own identity, we have our own history, we have our own culture. There is no need for us to be Does pandering to, like to, to thoughts of being like concerned I'm about... Sorry, no, one, I'm just one, being one polemic moment. because sorry, that's what I'm like. One brief like. moment. One brief uh, moment. <laughs> I am absolutely not denying that African people have a dif distinct identity. I said that that's where Fanon was at in that moment when all of those people were doing all of that, that, that work in the late 40s and, 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 and early 50s. I, I defined um, the essence of my Africanness as A, biological, and B, cultural. So that I'm not arguing that at all. What I'm saying is that these discourses around race are on the whole foolish and pointless, and that I do not believe that any of them will find a way of talking to white people about race that does not make them uncomfortable. Yeah. That's what Tot I'm saying. Oh, I so totally agree with that. Me. What I disagree with is the idea that we have to wait for some sort of permission. No, I'm not saying we, we should wait for anything. Yeah. I um, am for We need action. different forums. We need different I forms for, of action right, to well, actually do this. If we're going to wait for white people to tell us who we are, we'll be waiting for another 50 years. Can we have some order, please? Yeah, I'm done. Uh, right, I've probably got a couple of more contributions to take and then we're going to have to wrap up. So in the middle there, can you keep your hands up, please? Uh, yes, in the so front can here. Can we have some female voices, please? Yeah, yes. I've, had a, I've had the mic for a while. <laughs> um, well, put your hands up. <laughs> yeah, um, all I wanted to talk about, actually, was leading on from this point, was accessibility. And also what your thoughts on the fact that Franz Fanon was quite middle class because he had access into a world which a lot of black people would not have had access into. So his white mask, I, th I feel, would have been very different from the white, the black, the white mask of a cleaner or uh, the immigrants in Italy or in this current state, maybe, for example, the hip hop artist but that we might see compared to his white mask as a PhD student or my white mask as an educator or a teacher or trainee art psychotherapist or whatever. And I feel that sometimes when I watch these things and I listen to Franz Fanon, I do feel alienated within the fact that he had that access and a lot of people don't have that access. And therefore, the white mask that we see that he's, he's been shattered is not necessarily the same white mask that a lot of black people are experiencing at, in this present time especially under a neoliberalist agenda where we have been separated, we have been told to be outstanding in what we do in order we have to own a blackness, which is perhaps maybe not necessarily who we are, but in order to fit in and to get ahead. So I feel like it's, it's a very kind of tricky situation, I think, watching Franz Fanon and this film, reading the book, and also linking it to now and to how the black struggle is in this country him being a kind of middle class French colon, well, French, a, a boy of the French colonies. Very different struggle. So I just okay. wanted to know your thoughts. Uh, can we take this lady down the front, please? This one. Um, I just had a question about um, touching on the different violences that we've talked about that the film shows. So obviously there's the psychological and the physical violences, which are the very real ones of colonialism but there's also the element of epistemic violence that I feel like we haven't talked about, so violence on knowledge and knowledge production, um, which I feel like um, is a key uh, conversation we need to be having in a country like Britain, where colonialism is Do like Do you want to elaborate on that a bit? So like epistemic violence on like our curriculum, why our curriculums are so white and imperialist and only kind of <laughs> tell the victor's side of history rather than the actual, um, actual history, um, history without the capital H. So my question to you is, um, how can we harness kind of um, Fanon's like revolutionary spirit to um, decolonize our curriculums and decolonize our mindsets and the way we think in Britain? 
Okay, so two questions there, one on uh, class background of Fanon and the other on the violence of uh, our curriculum system and Fanon's uh, notions of decolonization. With, with due respect to the sister who, who spoke from the back, my hearing isn't perfect. I really didn't hear your question, so, so I'm, I'm going to leave it. Not disrespect, I really didn't hear. Um, th this, this sister, um, I'm worried about the, the replication of, of, of alleged modes of, of, of violence, um, but, uh, and, and I'm not sure how impressed I am by the efforts here that talk about decolonizing the curriculum. The, 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 the curriculum in UK universities, and I've taught in them and studied in them for, for, for decades, um, the, the, the curriculum is, and, and it's moving to the right, <laughs> the, the, the curriculum of this place is, is what the British capitalist class and their academic acolytes wish it to be. And it is, it is racist, it is sexist, it is pro-imperialist, and so on and so forth. It can't be, you know, so, you can conduct a, 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 a struggle around it, but the way to do it is, is to, um, you know, devise particular courses and fight for them through the, 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 the university structures. And all of this stuff that I'm hearing sounds to me like almost cheap excitement, but I'm not sure. Okay. Cheap excitement. Whoa. Okay. So um, the 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 lady that asked the thing about class, I think. I think you have a very relevant point because, and I also think there is a very particular schism of the um, that is held by the black middle class in terms of the black skin white mask debate, in terms of what is um, what is perceived, and having a language that allows you to progress, that allows you to progress academically, professionally, and so forth, but having possibly I don't know a soul, a cultural identity that differs from the mask that you're wearing professionally. Who knows? But would that possibly mean that Fanon might not speak to people? I'm not sure. I actually think that Fanon can speak across class barriers and does speak across, across class barriers um, because we wear those masks in different ways. And I think his, his language and his understanding of the psychology of that was deep enough for us to read it in other ways other than his own. So know who Black Fans Fanning is if you are conscious. Yeah. It's more about mm -hmm. how yeah, about people that. have kind of owned this, they own the idea that there is a mask, how they get past that because it's accessibility. I mean, we're talking about, I think this, this, this guy's saying that there wasn't enough people talking about these kind of things in, for example, institutions or there isn't enough people challenging. It's upsetting that Franz Fanon was over 70 years ago and we're not really thinking about the future going forward, how that white mask has changed. Because a lot of people now, they understand the idea of the, sh the shattering and they will own it in a different way, but there is still not much unity and not much conscious giving to people who do not have the accessibility of this at all. So, yeah. I mean, I, I would question whether Fanon's work is that well known. Yeah. I think somebody on the panel made the point that even students studying psychology do not know who Fanon is, right? And I, well, I don't think that's because of Fanon's class background. In fact, there are many people from uh, the lower classes, so we say, who've made profound impacts on society. You know, Ho Chi Minh was a washer-upper at the Dorchester Hotel and ended up leading the Vietnamese army and defeating the greatest economic power on the earth. You know, so um, the idea of class and how you, um, you actually <laughs> can understand ideas of anti-colonialism and transformation, I think, you know, I'm open to the idea that actually, if you are working class and no matter what your background, if you want to learn and you have the hunger and the thirst for it, you will learn. And also, just to point out that we, we have had some serious conversations about race. In 99, 2000, when you had the Stephen Lawrence inquiry, and there was a change in the law, and a whole bunch of cultural institutions in, in, invest in training and discussions and workshops, etc. And in fact, that was that was 20 years ago almost now. So mm -hmm. you did have them, but then what's happened since? And you could actually argue that the political climate now is worse mm -hmm. now than it was yeah. then. And what how does that what does that mean? But apart from that, when it comes to having conversations with white people, sometimes you do have to 
have conversations with white people about these issues. Because if, if I didn't have conversations with white people, then this event would not be taking place because there'd be no African Odysseys, no 10 years of these kind of films, it just won't happen because this is a white controlled institution. Yeah. So for this to happen, there has to be a conversation and in, in, in interaction. That's just obvious. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. I'm going to, I mean, unless there's any final thoughts, what I'd like the panelists to do is just um, to give one significant factor in terms of Fanon's legacy that they think is still significant today. Uh, and then I'm going to um, ask to wrap it up. I mean, so, Starting with you, Cecil. I think that Fanon's entire corpus, entire body of work, is, remains relevant. All of the issues that he deals with um, speak to current oppression and speak more abstractly to the human condition. And as a, quote, revolutionary Pan-Africanist, it matters that this man theorized very systematically and, and very penetratingly the state of neocolonialism, which is what Africans outside of the diaspora now confront as the way in which imperialism rules us in those places. And Fanon saw all of it. And he died, was it in 19, what? 61. 1961. So, yeah. yeah. And I would say briefly, um, his perception and analysis of Tarzan. I mentioned Tarzan before, because Tarzan was shown in the Caribbean and Africa, and it was all about white supremacy, the white guy is better, faster, stronger, et cetera, et cetera. And he was speaking about Tarzan back in, what, 60, when he, was when he died. Mm -hmm. And only, what, two years ago, there was a new film with um, that guy, guy, guy from True Blood, Alexander Skarsgård, who, who played Tarzan in a more recent inversion, inversion, invention of Tarzan. So that ideology of white supremacy being the white man is stronger, faster, better, is still around even now. So what we're saying then is still, still relevant now. And to link it into how we're going to use this to go forward, his perceptions, his ideas are incorporated into, course, into events like this, but we also do our own courses, our own workshops. So we have, I mean, if you, you, you might not get this stuff at university, but there's nothing to stop us from putting on six week, 12 week courses, which we're doing right now. We actually have a course called 10 Years of African Odysseys, Black Films, White Power. It's six weeks long. It's looking at all these issues from a black perspective, from African perspective. Court in France, Fernand, did the same thing with James Bond. We also have a course called African Women Resistance Leaders, Political and Spiritual. So one thing to do is to actually do your own, or design your own courses, or come to courses that are not part of the mainstream, because that's where you get that, that information. Okay, Simon Moore. Okay, so um, I think that Fanon is a revolutionary. Um, he lived his revolution, and he was... So he didn't just fight through his writing, he fought. And I think what I take from Fanon is to be your own revolution. Be the revolution you want to see. You read Fanon, pass on a book of Fanon to somebody who hadn't heard of Fanon, who then passes on the book to somebody else. It is, it is about being part of the revolution, joining these courses. Um, all of us are cultural warriors in our own different ways, who have put on events, run courses and do things and so it's finding ways to engage with that stuff and be your own fan and in your own life and what I would say is that I read um, I was reading Claude McKay recently mm -hmm. um, and and he said you know we have to fight let us not die an ignoble death because we're gonna die anyway if we must so die be a revolution mm -hmm. if we must die mm -hmm. yes beautiful okay um, I'm gonna thank our panelists Samuel Sachet Tony Warner, Cecil Gutsmo, uh, and myself, Kunle Olalod, uh, Boys for Change. Um, please do.